Hi everyone, I'm Shanghai Kate, and this is the lovely Miss, Miss FX, Fade FX. Uh, this is Fade, and she's here from Brighton to visit me, and we've been hanging out for about a week, and she's been such a great guest. She's such an amazing woman. You have to look for her on Instagram and on Facebook, I think, Yeah. as well as just on my Instagram and follow her as she has adventures all the way around the world, basically going to document headhunting, tattooing, tribal tattooing in Sumatra and Borneo, two of the places I most dearly want to go. And she's making documentaries about them and they are also on my Instagram. She also is going around the world or a portion of around the world sailing with a female crew to bring attention to the, uh, plast the plastic pollution in our oceans. Very, very important cause. And I'll let her explain that to you in a moment. But first we're going to read a letter that she brought to me from a 10 year old girl. She's nine, I think this weekend she turned 10. Uh, that's okay. right. So she is um, a fan of mine and uh, she wrote me this beautiful little letter and so I'm going to read it so she can, she can know that I got it and that um, I'm deeply touched by it. And her name is Winona and this is the letter. <laughs> and she says to Shanghai Kate with happy face, Hi, as you probably know, my name is Winona. I am nine years old, nearly 10, exclamation point. My birthday is on May the 1st, May Day. When is your birthday? My birthday is October 29th, 1943, so a long time ago. I received your magazine and thank you very much. It is awesome. I sent a magazine that I had been profiled in. I read the article and it is very interesting. I didn't know that you and Fade knew each other so well and we're getting to know each other a lot better. And so, and I, I'm really looking forward to getting to know Fade a whole lot better. She now calls me grandma, which I think is <laughs> wonderful. I'm part of her family. Tattoo family grandma. Yeah. Can I ask you some questions? Winona asks. Number one, has Sailor Jerry ever tattooed you? No, Sailor Jerry did not tattoo me. That when I knew Sailor Jerry, first of all, women didn't get tattoos very often, and when they did, they were usually in very private places, and I wanted him to think of me as just strictly a very serious tattoo artist, and so I didn't get a tattoo by him. I somewhat regret it, but at the same time, I think it was the right thing to do. How did you and Sailor Jerry meet? Um, my partner at the time, Michael Malone, and I did a, convention, a, a, a museum show at the Museum of American Folk Art, and Jerry was one of the principal artists that we highlighted, and out of gratitude, he invited us to his home in Hawaii. So we went to his home in Hawaii, and um, then I stayed longer than everyone else, and it was a terrific experience. How did you get the name Shanghai? I got the name Shanghai from a good friend of mine, Jack Rudy, who is also a tattoo artist. Jack and I worked together for a long time, but always I worked in Chinatowns, um, in New York and in Philadelphia, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Honolulu. Um, everywhere I worked for 40 years, there was a Chinatown. So Jack called me Shanghai because I could get people to do things for me without payment. <laughs> I try to pay them in some way, somehow, <clears throat> but I kind of Shanghai people, which is an old Chinese term for uh, stealing labor, and uh, <laughs> then I was always in the Chinatowns. Please send me some more letters and we can be pen pals. Bye, talk to you soon. Love, bye, Winona. So sweet. Thank you so much, Winona. Yes, we will send pictures and I'm gonna frame this and put this on my wall and so I can always look at it and think about you. And so Fade, I'm so excited to have you here. And Thank it's you. been a wonderful visit with you. It's great to be here. I'm and I'm really gonna miss that. you terribly. I'm gonna miss you terribly. What a great guest you've been. She's she gets up in the morning and makes us coffee and tea. <laughs> it's really good British tea. And 
Uh, she just wanted to relax, and so she did a lot of trapeze training <laughs> while she was every here. Every day. <laughs> every day, hanging from trapeze bars, and I, that was great to watch, and it was inspiring to me. And um, she does that for fun, and do you make money doing that? Um, I perform with a group of aerialists, so it's like an aerial theatre, and this summer I've just finished um, rehearsing and directing a show for Sea Shepherd, Sea Shepherd Global. Um, so the show is based on ocean conservation and particularly IUU fishing, which is illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, uh -huh. which is just destroying our oceans and the, the wildlife, the habitat. So it's focusing on that and we're all performing in net. There's a piece where we're synchronised in net, getting caught up, and then we each do our solos. So that's really interesting and it has some footage from their campaigns. And so that's going to be at Glastonbury this summer and also at Boomtown and we're going to do some shows in Brighton as well. So really and enjoyed you, that. And you do that on a ship? No, no, no that's just in a, in a building with a high ceiling. Okay. We'll do rigging or when it's outdoors we'll have a have a rig set up right. so and you like bring a the sail and you can show the movie on the sail that's correct yeah. and one part of the show the the sail comes up and there's projections on that with video footage and so you're going to be gone how long on this voyage and where okay are so that's another thing i'm going to be participating in x expedition which is uh, a crew of all fe so it's all female crew of 300 people and it's going to circumnavigate the globe over the course of two years, so from 2019 to 2021. And the, um, the motive of this expedition is to combat plastic pollution and ocean toxicity and empower women. So throughout the globe, we'll be stopping at various locations where there are local NGOs, local communities and groups that are tackling plastic pollution. So this will create a global network where everyone's going to be linked, looking at how to deal with this together, because we are all in it together. And we're going to be collecting um, data for microplastics. So every two nautical miles, we'll scoop a mesh out of the water and analyse what's what's in there. Mm -hmm. And the leg of the journey that I'm on is between Easter Island and Tahiti. So it's the most uh, remote islands in the planet. And we're going to be crossing for three weeks without going to land. If the weather's good, we get to stop at the Picton Islands in the middle. And oh, those wow. islands, it's said by National Geographic that 3,500 pieces of plastic wash up there every day. Oh my but God. But they're the most remote islands of the planet. So it's really quite shocking. I think we're going to have some, some pretty shocking experiences. Yeah. And that will be good to bring back to our communities to, you know, really really look at what we're doing with the plastic pollution yeah. with our planet yeah. and try and encourage change. Pitcairn Pit Island is mm -hmm. where um, the Mutiny on the Bounty uh, survivors I, um, settled <coughs> and, okay. uh, and um, I, so that's how I know it. Okay. But, uh, know yeah, it's, uh, it, was, it was where Captain Bly kicked off Christian Fletcher and after the mutiny and they wound up on that island mm -hmm. and populated it so that's that's fascinating and you live on a boat yeah that's correct yeah pirate's life for me a little, <laughs> a little doggy yeah 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 he's super cute beautiful little um, pit bull yeah. so um so you're a trapeze artist and you're working with that and now you're looking for funding and crowdfunding and support and sponsors. That's correct. So I'm trying to get sponsorship for X Expedition. So 100% of the proceeds go to fighting um, the plastic pollution and dealing with ocean toxicity. So I'm, I'm representing my part and I get sponsorship for my contribution is what I'm going for. So I have a crowdfunder going at the moment and mm -hmm. I'm offering tattoos and my marine themed mirrors and things like that. And I've also linked a group of tattooists globally. So tattoo studios all around the world are doing marine flash days, putting the proceeds and you know their, their day's work and their skills towards helping the ocean. So it's creating a really nice network. And how do people find this uh, crowdfunding? Um, it's crowdfunder and it's if crowdfunding, crowdfunder.com forward slash ocean change maker, Meraki Fade, M-E-R-A-K-I-F-A-D-E. And that brings up another uh, aspect of your many talents, which is you have a company that produces uh, geometric designs on mirrors and wallpaper. That's correct. Yes, and yeah. what's that company called? Smokeandmirrorsfx.com. Okay, so yeah. people can find. She gave me a beautiful mirror uh, of, a, of a crab, 
She also does incredible geometric tattooing, and so the crab has geometric tattoo patterns on it. It's beautiful. And um, then your film about the, the uh, indigenous people on the islands of uh, Borneo and, and Borneo. Uh, yeah, Borneo. Could you tell me a little bit about those? Yeah, so I started traveling to Borneo when I was about 18, 19. So a lot of people I knew were going off to India or Thailand or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd worked with tattoo artists that are from headhunter tribes in Borneo. And they'd always been saying, come, you know, come to Borneo, you'll love it. So I did. I just went on my own. And uh, I went back five times and became adopted by a village there on um, a longhouse on Scrang River. They're like my family and uh -huh. I had a really beautiful time with them. They taught me to tattoo hand tap. So just using two sticks with a needle tied to the end, I can tattoo that way as well. And I learned a lot about the designs and the culture and yeah, just absorbed all of that experience was really good. But I also saw the deforestation issues that they, yeah. were, they were facing at the time. So I made a documentary with them to uh, document tattoo history because every time I went, I'd meet a hundred year old person. So at the time it was like 2007, I think they're born in like 1907 and what they've seen in their lifetime and how different things were then. You know, the stories they tell us they're not written down and passed on once that person's gone. So I really wanted to document that um, and also uncover or expose the deforestation issues that's shaping their, their world and tattoo future as well. So yeah, things like religion and capitalism are really shaping the future for the indigenous cultures. So yeah, it's covering that. And then that led me going to West Sumatra. So. A friend of mine crowdfunded to take solar lighting out to the Mentawai Islands where, um, yeah, so we delivered these solar panels and it's to help them remain um, independent of Indonesian oil industries because they were colonised and they rounded up all of the tattooed people because the tattooed people are Sikre, which is cross between a shaman and a medicine person mm -hmm. and they'd be tattooed jaw to ankles and they call it their eternal clothing. And it's a mark of, um, it's like a mark of skill and how accomplished you are. So you'd get a certain tattoo when you become an adult, you get a certain tattoo when you, you know, you've got a really strong skill set. And then the highest grade tattoo you would get is when, you know, you can resolve conflicts between your family, other people's families, you're a really good person in the community. Right. So yeah, that it's got a really beautiful, unique tattoo history and the Indonesian government founded the tattoo people rounded them up, took them to mainland and publicly undressed them and beat them and put them into forced modernization camps. So it was really important to help them remain independent of oil industries. And I used that opportunity to go in and document tattoo history and make some friends there. So I really want to go back and make a full length feature, feature length film. I made a five minute one just with footage that I got myself. Mm -hmm. So I had to trek through jungles and swamps and all kinds of stuff to get to these beautiful wooden umas, the long houses there that they live in. Mm -hmm. But um, I'd like to go back with a proper amount of camera equipment and a proper crew to make a, a feature length film is one of my plans for next year also. And do you have a crowdfunding for that? Not yet, but it's something that I'm looking, you know, I've written a treatment for the movie, so I'm looking to work with film people and apply for film funding. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I'm working on next. Well, I really would like to see this come to fruition. I've seen these films, and you can see them, they're on YouTube, and um, they're short, one's five minutes, that's the teaser, and then there's a 30 minute film that goes in to her de into depth with her uh, travels to Borneo. They are riveting, they are eye-opening, and of course I have a great interest in tribal women tattooing and the tribal history of tattooing, and I learned so much just, for the, just from these two little films that are very pleasant to watch and and the way that they're told is so fluid and um, there's a lot of information there and I sh all of her projects deserve your support. So research her, find her, Thank donate you, to her. I'm going to, Ross and I are going to, and we're gonna do everything we can to support her. And I think that this is a one of the most worthy things that has come across my scope of vision for a long time. 
not just because she calls me grandma, not just because I love her and she brings me cookies, but because she's one of a kind. There's, I've not met any other woman like Faith. Aww. So please look at her work, please consider finding her at a tattoo convention uh, where she'll be working and seek out her crowdfunding platforms and help her with $5, $10. You get rewards, you get prizes if you do, and so it's not that you're just donating money, you're helping the world at the same time. Which, and I don't think there's another more noble cause than doing that. Thank you, Kate. Um, I had a couple of questions for you because I'm working on a book with my documentation of tattoo history. And obviously I've gone um, you know, to Southeast Asia and documented tribal tattoo history. But I really wanted to talk with you as a historian and the godmother of tattooing about the history of tattooing in the Western culture and find out what you know about how far back there are records for and the transitions in bringing that to now. Well, the, uh, you know, as you have already explained, tattooing is an oral history. It doesn't, what happened to my hair? Uh, <laughs> just a moment. Uh, tattooing is an oral history and people who hold it in their hands told stories and that's why it was so easy to obliterate because when that older person dies those stories disappear and uh, at least 50% of them are never recorded and probably 90% of them are not recorded. And in America we have uh, tattoo artists who are uh, carriers of our tradition and they're dying and so with every loss of uh, Tennessee Dave, Coney Island, Freddie, Crazy Eddie, um, uh, Rick Walters, um, you know, Bill Salmon, a lot of them are di dying very rapidly. Uh, I'm one of the few that still remains that has been lucky enough to listen to some of these stories and remember them and put them into uh, book form, which is what I'm doing. Tattooing in America, uh, it really starts with Europe. That's when um, our, most of our history comes from. When we, you talk about art history in, in Europe, you talk about people like Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. When you talk about art history in America, we talk about Walt Disney and Mickey Mouse. Um, we didn't really have a long, stable history of um, of art because so many of so much of it in the New World in our Americas uh, was held in the hands of indigenous people, and so. Uh, when they were conquered by the missionaries or Christianity, and uh, I love your phrase, the uh, Bible and the bulldozer comes and uh, alters history. I think that's one of the best summations of it all. Um, so when the, uh, first of all, in the European continent, tattooing was banned. It was, it was fluctuating, it was like thriving and everybody loved tattooing. What year was that? That was uh, up until 383 AD. Okay. When the Caesars became popes, Constantine, Constantine became a pope and when he uh, converted to Christianity and started banning tattooing throughout the known Roman Empire. That ban, which spread from Wales and Ireland and the Picts up in northern England, all the way over to China through the North American continent and uh, the Asian subcontinent. Uh, that huge swath of area was completely banned in 787 by Pope Hadrian and his Roman Council of Bishops. So for 1500 years, that ban lasted for a thousand years. For 1500 years, there was no tattooing going on in within that huge portion of the world. However, it was thriving in the Pacific and in uh, places that hadn't been discovered yet. And it was until, I mean, it was discovered, but nobody wrote about it. I'm sure the Vikings were there. I'm sure there were other people who were coming to America and discovering um, the Americas. But uh, people thought the world was flat and if you sailed off of it, you would be eaten by dragons. So nobody really went anywhere or even talked about it the uh, expensive expeditions, but when they started looking for spices, that's when they started looking for um, 
uh, the other places on the, the other side of the world. And that's when they discovered Indian people who were running around with no clothes on. And largely the women were the ones who were getting tattooed. Most of the paintings and the documentation, excuse me, is that cookie coming back? <laughs> um, most of the documentation uh, is of women tattooing other women because that was their rite of passage. Men were taken when young boys into a um, jungle and circumcised. Women were put in a hut and then visibly marked around their mouths and chins and hands um, to note that they were then fertile and then they could be sold or traded and expanded territory. So uh, it's a very wise thing that happened. I don't know how they did it because they didn't have science on their side. But when they discovered these Polynesian people tattooing, for example, Captain James Cook, uh, he kidnapped a lot of the people who were heavily tattooed and brought them back to Europe and reintroduced tattooing to the higher classes who lived in uh, Europe and England and France and Germany and so forth. And then at the same time, synchronicity, synchronicity, uh, in Ch Japan, Japan was locked down for 250 years. And it was around that same time that Captain Cook discovered the Polynesian Islands and started exploring them that Commander Perry discovered Japan and broke through their isolationism and was able to go to Japan and discover that 80% of the people that were the men, 80% of the men that worked outside had full body suits called horimono, which means one image. And so the royalty then started going to Japan to get these massive pieces of tattooing. So um, that began the influx of tattooing back into the English and the European uh, continent. And, um, and then the uh, s people were tapping by hand. That's what they did all the time because they didn't have any machines except Thomas Edison here in America in the late 1800s discovered that he could make a thing called the electric pen. And he sold it to Pembroke for a lot of money, but uh, it was used by stenographers to make um, mimeographed images or to write a letter and then it could be repeated and repeated and repeated. Um, Samuel O'Reilly in 1890 discovered that invention and decided to fine tune it and so he patented it as a tattoo machine. And that's when men got a hold of the tattooing here in the Western world and decided to make it go faster and harder and thereby more more financially uh, appealing. And so women gave it up, said, we don't need it. We do everything else. You can tattoo as well as make war and hunt and gather food. That's what they did. And so uh, a little bit of this um, knowledge that I received from you with this film is that in uh, some of these uh, cultures, in uh, Borneo and so forth, they do have great significant meanings behind their tattoos, which I always thought was the truth. But a lot of them got them just for decoration, to say, look mm -hmm. at me, look how powerful I am, look how strong yeah. I am. It was a mark of class as well, the upper yeah. class. Quite often they have very heavily tattooed daughters. Right. So if you go to a village, you can see the wealth, you can see the beauty and the women and things like that. And so other families would want to marry into that village and it would, like a strong economy as such. Right. Yeah. Right. Tattooing always was for the higher class people. I, on right. my lecture, the first slide I have is first class all the way because it was a craft for only those who deserved to earn it. And um, for one reason or another, through wealth or through power or through magic or uh, control, whatever. Um, the, the, it, the lower classes didn't really get tattooed, except the women, when they were fertile, they would get this mark. And that was everywhere around the world, so I don't know how that sent, who sent that email out that all girls should get their lips and their chins tattooed. Um, it leads us to me to believe in the one continent concept, mm -hmm. where then the world splits yeah, up. Yeah, the Berber continent. in North Africa, actually, the Berber women had this tattoo. That, yeah. That does ring true with me. Well, Japan, the pearl divers, in Okinawa have it, yep. the uh, Moroccan the women have it, mm -hmm. the uh, New Zealand women have mm -hmm. it, um, 
let's see who else er, 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 oh, the Alaskan women have it um, the American women the American Indians have it so mm -hmm. it spread and we don't know who issued that email so it's kind of a mystery that <laughs> it leads me to believe that we are all one tribe mm -hmm. but um, so uh, in the Civil War times, a young, a young man named Martin Hildebrand decided that he wanted to uh, tattoo soldiers, both in the Union camps and the Civil War camps. So he started the whole concept of traveling tattoo artist. And he would go to both camps, both sides of this war, and he would tattoo the soldiers who were sitting around in tents, idly waiting for the next battle. And so he made his money doing that. And he was the one who opened the very first tattoo shop in America in Boston and soon after opening the tattoo shop in Boston he realized that New York was a better fit so he moved to New York and opened the first tattoo shop in New York so he was um, the first real tattoo traveling artist who brought tattooing to the people here in America and then of course P.T. Barnum was the one who saw that people would, we didn't have television, so entertainment was uh, few and far between. Everybody was working 12 hour days in a you know, sewing factory or something. So they needed entertainment. So P.T. Barnum, the man who said that there's a sucker born every minute, um, built a huge museum called, um, I can't remember the name of the museum at the moment. Uh, but it was in New York City, and he had Jumbo, the biggest elephant, and he had Dumbo, the tiniest elephant. And he had uh, uh, tattooed oddities and people with twins growing out of their stomachs and all sorts of things that you could look at. It was the very first sideshow carnival place. It was, it was full of animals and freaks and all sorts of things. Remember, though, that freak and, uh, and odd things were very interesting to people. Coney Island was built as an incubator for premature babies. People don't know this, but people would go to Coney Island and one of the biggest attractions there was for people to look at babies in incubators who are premature. People are strange, aren't they? Well, everything, we yeah. have been so strange. Some people, people are strange, strange yeah. yeah, some people. So, yeah, that's uh, true. yeah we yeah. want to give some people <laughs> yeah. some leeway there. But. Uh, he had a man there called Prince Constantine who he had forcibly, or not forcibly, but he, he had him tattooed heavily for exhibition. And uh, now this was the time when women didn't demonstrate any skin. They didn't show any skin or anything. They were, you know, dressed from their necks to their wrists to all the way to their ankles. They put like 17 pounds of clothes on before they wow. ever left the house or their bedroom. So and, cool. Oh, so yeah, comfortable. So, and not smelling so great, anyway, especially in those New York summers. But um, they, uh, he had Prince Constantine, who was presented as a wild man who had been a Greek prince who had been captured in the wilds of Borneo and tattooed against his will. But actually, it was a, an English tattoo artist, George Bouchette, who had tattooed him heavily, and then he was put on demonstration. So people started seeing people who were tattooed in circuses and sideshows, mm -hmm. and then women started getting tattooed, and then so they, in order to see their tattoos, you have to take all their clothes off. So it was kind of a hoochie coochie show plus a show about tattooing, and so it lived and thrived in carnivals for years and years. And that's what appealed to me when I first started getting into tattooing were these carnival people who seemed to live a life of freedom and adventure and. They were also an extended family, mm -hmm. and I was so drawn to their personalities, like Huck Spaulding and his wife Josie, and Paul Rogers, who was an acrobat and a, and a uh, trapeze artist as well. Uh, these people were thrilling for me to get to meet and know because they loved each other so much, and they loved travel, and they loved adventure, and they were tattoo artists, and I said, that's for me, so that's how I got involved in it. Um, but then, you know, it started with the, uh, the magazines, you know, it started with tattoo shops growing, then it started supply companies, then it started with magazines, then now, of course, it's all over television. And so the walls have fallen in, the, you know, 
rules have all changed and tattooing is in its biggest heyday, probably since the beginning of the Roman Empire. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely at the biggest boom right now, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Really interesting times. It wow. might be changing though. Mm, with this cosmetic takeover yeah. Yeah. of the tattoo inks. I will just That's a whole the, other subject. We'll okay, we'll talk there. about it another time. But yeah, know that the tattoo. world of tattooing is going to change pretty significantly because all of this, all of these, will no longer be available to us. And why is that, Kate? Okay? Just tell us why a little bit. Well, because it, the word, because people started to use it, doing cosmetic tattooing in their shops, and cosmetic, um, the word cosmetic, uh, drew the attention of Revlon. Lancome and L'Oreal and other significant uh, pharmaceutical companies because cosmetics by definition cannot be inserted intern internally in the body so when you start cos talking about cosmetics and then you're putting them inside the body it's against the law because cosmetic molecules are too big to put through the skin that's why you buy a cream that promises you to get rid of your wrinkles, but it doesn't work because it cannot go through skin your skin. It's a barrier, that's what it's for, isn't right. it? Right. Yeah. So it cannot go through the skin. So when we start calling things cosmetic tattooing, it gets the attention of cosmetic companies. And so these major cosmetic companies and pharmaceutical companies have lobbied the FDA and have lobbied the EU to ban tattoo pigments as we know them um, and to then reinvent their own tattoo pigments um, that would meet their criteria and then they're going to sell our pigments back to us which will be mm -hmm. significantly altered without the knowledge of without any tattooing knowledge. to produce them right. yeah right and That's so they'll that. be very expensive two hundred dollars for a teeny and tiny hard to imagine bottle. they'll be as good as this stuff so. oh no because the yeah. particles will be ground down so they can be put in the skin yeah so they're like, oh i have a duck I'm sorry. <laughs> you have a duck in your studio? Sorry. Um, sorry, the ducks just flew over. Um, so, uh, yeah, they won't be, because the body has certain specifications that it needs uh, in order to keep pigment within it, and that means particle size. Yeah. So, if you have tiny, tiny particles, your white blood cells that eat up all the particles of color can grab them more easily and eat them and remove them. Yeah. And so they could fade essentially. So f yeah. So f quickly. Yeah. And um, yeah. So the world is going to change. A lot of people are going to drop out. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are, you know, saying they're going to mix their own colors, but that's going to be against the law. So you can't do that. And where are you going to get the root colors anyway? Yeah. Because nobody can sell them because they're illegal. So uh, you maybe can this is going underground again. Oh yeah. Maybe this is going full circle. It is. Time to stock up on some inks whilst they're good. Yeah, and then <laughs> and hope I won't that, stop tattooing. And then hope that no, well, it's going to affect black too. Yeah. The black is being yeah, affected. Yeah, luckily I don't use a lot of color, but. Yeah. yeah. So the way that you want to fight this and get involved in this is go to Coalition for Tattoo Safety. And that okay. is um, online and you can find it on my Instagram and um, it will uh, it's all tattoo artists banding together, not challenging these people, not challenging the laws that are already in place, not challenging and calling the cosmetic companies names. That's not how we get this done. How we get this done is we join legally with uh, attorneys who are fighting this, as well as Mario Barth, Tramp from um, Eternal, and various other pigment big wigs in the business who make mo most of our pigments worldwide, get together with them and join this coalition and you will keep up to date with it and you can follow it on my Instagram as well. And what's and, your Instagram, Kate? Uh, I'm at, at Shanghai Kate. Pretty easy. My uh, Facebook, I have four or five Facebook pages, <laughs> so you should be able to find me on one of those. And uh, yeah, and so that's what we're talking about here. When Fade was with us, and hopefully she'll come back soon, and we have more information to share with you. Thank you so much, Kate. It's been an absolute pleasure staying here with you. Yeah. Oh, I'm sad to go. I have I'm to go get my flight to, to New York. Oh, I know. Till next time. Yes. Hopefully I'll see you in LA when we're working on the series. Yes, and that's another thing that's coming up. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye.